evening and um, welcome to our sixth and final event in the Academy's 2022 speaker series, Surprising Science, Borrowed Ideas Leading to Unimagined Consequences. It sounds pretty exciting to me. Um, so before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which I'm standing, the Ngunnawal people. And it is upon their ancestral land that the Australian Academy of Science is built. As we share our own knowledge here tonight, we talk about our teachings and our learnings and research practices. It's important to remember and pay respect to the knowledge of the embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So I'm Professor Naomi McClure Griffiths. I'm a newly elected fellow at the Australian Academy of Science. And I'm here on behalf of the convener of tonight's program, Professor Nanda Dasgupta, who couldn't be here tonight. So it's actually my great pleasure to be here and get to hear these wonderful talks. Uh, also joining me tonight is the convener of the series, Professor Drew Evans from the University of South Australia. Hello, Drew. Hello, Naomi. Uh, and absolutely uh, a, a big thank you for being in the Shine Dome this evening and helping us with our final event for the year. And on a personal note, a huge congratulations on your recent election to the Academy. Thank you. Um, I, just as uh, Naomi, oh, yep, definitely need to uh, pause for a clap there. <laughs> um, I'd also like to just take a, a moment to acknowledge that tonight I'll be joining you all from the traditional lands of the Turbal people of the Brisbane region and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you to our audiences, plural, uh, for joining us both online and in person in the dome tonight. We will hear about some surprising science about light very shortly from Professor Devi Stewart Fox and Professor Dragomir Neshev. They will no doubt surprise and inspire you and well, personally, myself as well, about their, their research work. Now, just before we uh, hear from them t this evening, there's just a few things. For those of you who have been to a few of these events in the past, you'll know, know where I'm about to go. That is, if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, you can do so by using the hashtag SurprisingScience. Questions from our online audience can be submitted by scanning the QR code on screen. And I really encourage you to, to submit your questions. So far this series, I'd have to say the online audience is, is winning the question tally. And so that's a, a challenge that we put out to our audience that's there in person tonight in the Shine Dome. And you can ask your questions during the Q&A session by using the microphone uh, that's off off to the side of the stage during the Q&A session that will be at the end of both of our talks. So now let's hear from our first speaker, Professor Devi Stewart Fox. So Devi is a professor at the School of Biosciences at the University of Melbourne and is co-chair of the University of Melbourne's Hallmark Research Initiative in Bioinspiration. She studies the biology of light and colour from optical properties at the nanometer scale to global patterns of colour diversity. To hear more, please join me in welcoming Debbie. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank the conveners for the opportunity to be here and to you all for coming out this evening and of course to the people who have joined uh, online. I wanted to start by reflecting for a moment on light, if you excuse the bad pun. Without light, our planet would be dark, freezing cold and completely lifeless. Light from the sun powers all life on Earth. It generates heat, it drives fundamental chemical reactions like photosynthesis and of course, it's ultimately responsible for all the colours that we see. So I wanted to share with you some science on light in the natural world. And not just the light that we see, but the light that we can't see as well. And I guess 
<clears throat> Even though colours arise from the physics of light interacting with matter, ultimately colour is all in the mind. And the best way to appreciate that is by looking at visual illusions. So in this visual illusion, the circles in the image are all exactly the same colour. The only thing that differs is the colour of the lines uh, around them. So what this illusion shows is that we don't perceive the colour of actual objects themselves. We actually guess their colour based on the colour of the surroundings. Essentially, it's all relative. And it's exactly the same principle with brightness. So in this visual illusion, uh, <clears throat> this, the, the, the square moving there is actually exactly the same colour. It's not changing in brightness. But your mind is making rapid mental adjustments depending on the brightness of the background. So if colour is all relative and all in the mind, how on earth do we know what animals see? For starters, we can look at photoreceptors in animal eyes and we can measure the wavelengths of light that those photoreceptors are sensitive to. And then, to help our imaginations, we can try to render it in images. So here, for example, we have uh, an image of a flower, but it's actually got really distinct markings in the ultraviolet, which we can't see. And this is our attempt to render it as a bee might see it, based on the photoreceptors of a bee's eye. We now know quite a lot about the sensitivities of photoreceptors in different animals. But ultimately, because colour is all in the mind, to know what an animal sees, we have to ask it. And that involves painstaking behavioural experiments. You can ask my students on, you know, how to train your bee. It um, takes a great deal of, of patience. And it's the same with function. Ultimately, to know the functions of colour in nature, often we have to um, turn to animal behaviour. And so very early on in my career, I spent four years doing behavioural experiments on chameleons in South Africa, looking at colour change. And uh, chameleons actually change colour the most when they see another chameleon. So here you've got a dominant male showing his nice colours and a submissive male trying his best to hide. <clears throat> and they show their most spectacular colours uh, that are also in the UV that chameleons can, uh, can see, but we can't. <coughs> Excuse me. But what surprised us the most is when we actually showed predators to these chameleons. They changed colour, they turned on their camouflage colours. Here we have a, a, a stuffed a bird and a fake snake. So they try and hide, they become camouflaged. But individual chameleons actually consistently turn different colours to a bird and a snake. But it turns out that they actually appear equally camouflaged to birds and snakes because snakes have much poorer colour vision. So this early experience really brought home to me that we can't measure colours as we see them. If we want to understand colour in the natural world, then we really have to consider how those um, colours are perceived by the animals that view them. We tend to take the colours that we see for granted. Most of you are probably already familiar with the UV example, the fact that we don't see UV, but many animals do. But what you might not have considered is that we see colours that many animals don't. And that's red. So uh, most animals, the majority of animals, don't see red. It's not just dogs and cats. It's, uh, it's most insects as well. These um, images have been rendered so that the red pixels uh, have been recolored and more as a, a dog might, might see them. <coughs> Excuse me. But when you consider the colors that we see or the colors that any animals see, we actually see a fairly small range of the light um, of, of sunlight. So this graph actually shows the uh, spectrum of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface. And this rainbow band here shows this, the range of colours 
that we can see. We've got this little bit of UV on the left and then this whole big chunk called the near infrared. Red is at the upper limit of the wavelengths that we see uh, and it's beyond the limit for most animals. And so this raises the question, why is there this limit on the wavelengths of light that we see? Now, one answer comes down to biochemistry and biophysics. The fundamental molecular machinery of vision is common to all animals that can see. It basically involves a change in the molecular structure of a light sensitive molecule, and that triggers an electrical signal to our central nervous system, to the brain. And it turns out that the uh, longer the wavelengths our photoreceptors are sensitive to, the more they tend to be triggered by heat rather than light. And that essentially produces random noise. They stop being useful essentially because they become too noisy. But to me, this is an, an entirely satisfactory answer because there's quite a lot of variation in the maximum wavelength that animals can see. As I just um, mentioned, we see red, but other animals don't. So we wondered about the benefit of seeing red and far red. And to do this, we modelled what hypothetical insect visual systems would see if we shifted their sensitivity across this boundary that we call the red edge. We call it the red edge because, uh, because leaves actually reflect, are, are green, but then they reflect almost all of this near infrared light. Uh, and so <clears throat> we wondered if uh, animals in the natural world, like these beetles, could actually gain an advantage by seeing across this boundary. It turns out that they do, but only up to a point. So when an insect sees a flower versus a leaf or a beetle versus a leaf or a beetle versus a flower, we can look at how much visual contrast there is. And you can see these black dots here are the average visual contrast and they increase with, um, with essentially uh, uh, as, as visual systems become sensitive to longer and longer wavelengths. But it plateaus off. And essentially what that means is that the visual benefit diminishes. And so perhaps the reason that many animals don't see red and many animals don't see beyond that boundary is because it actually provides little visual benefit in their actual environment. So it's another case of needing to understand how animals might perceive, perceive the world to understand in this case um, the evolution of colour vision. Now, <clears throat> we don't see much beyond this red edge and neither do other animals. So you might be wondering, why, does this, why do we have this whole big chunk called the near infrared and why does it matter? And it's essentially because uh, around half of the energy in sunlight falls in the near infrared and if we absorb that energy we warm up faster. It's exactly the same for black and white in the visible spectrum. So black colours absorb light and therefore black colours uh, warm up faster than white colours that reflect all light. And it's exactly the same in the near infrared. <clears throat> And it turns out that different animals reflect very different amounts of this near infrared light. So here we have photos of various animals that all happen to be green. So we've got a green snake, a green chameleon and various green frogs, but they're wildly different in the near infrared. So in the near infrared photo, you can see this snake looks black, which means it's absorbing all of the near infrared. And here, this chameleon and these frogs are really pale, which means that they're reflecting the near infrared. So why such variation? And that's a question that we've been working on for several years in my research group. 
When we started, we were surprised at how little we knew about infrared properties in nature. We know a lot about colour. We even know quite a lot about UV colours in nature. But we knew very little about near-infrared. So we started just measuring the diversity of near-infrared colours in natural history uh, collections. And we started with birds. So here you can see there's quite a lot of variation in how much near-infrared light birds reflect, and you can see it in these photos as well. And when we measured near-infrared across this evolutionary tree of birds, across environments, um, all environments in Australia, so across the Australian continent, we found a surprisingly strong correlation between how much near-infrared light these birds reflect, and climate. Essentially, these birds reflect more near-infrared light in hot, dry climates, which is what you would expect. But it particularly matters for small birds. There's much less of a relationship for large birds. It matters for small birds in the desert because reflecting that near-infrared light reduces their risk of overheating and of dehydration. We've also looked now at this question in butterflies. So this time by taking near-infrared images. And we'd expect near-infrared to be even more important for butterflies because they don't have an insulating layer like birds. They can't produce their own heat and they need to get warm enough to fly, but they obviously can't overheat. And we found a similar pattern. <clears throat> so each of these dots represents a different butterfly species. Again, it's from across the Australian continent. And you can see that they reflect more infrared light in hotter environments. Another group has now shown that it's the same thing with European butterflies. So birds and butterflies can perhaps get the best of all worlds, if you like. They can be gaudy, invisible colour. They can show their gaudy colours to attract mates, or perhaps they can be camouflaged. But they can use invisible near-infrared light to passively heat and cool. Now, birds and butterflies are not the only ones to care about passive heating and cooling. We increasingly need more energy efficient ways to manage temperature in our environment, in our built environment. And so we've been delving more into the mechanisms at the nanometer scale that enable animals to efficiently reflect infrared light. We've been looking at this in beetles, <coughs> excuse me, and some of these beetles uh, reflect light extraordinarily efficiently. So here we have a scarab and you can see that it reflects almost all of the near infrared. And the way it does that uh, is through this complex composite material where it has a layer on top that essentially acts like a green filter, giving it the green appearance, but it has an underlying la layer with nanostructures that essentially reflect almost all infrared light. And it turns out that recently developed uh, coatings for passive cooling are using exactly the same principle. So they're new coatings, and instead of having one layer like a, a paint, they've got two layers. <coughs> Excuse me. And the top layer reflects, uh, sorry, um, is a coloured filter producing the colours that we want to see, and the bottom layer reflects near-infrared light. But these coatings involve some nasty chemicals in their production, and we can certainly improve on them. And so perhaps we can learn from beetles to produce more efficient coatings for passive cooling. And that's something that we're working on at the moment with collaborators. And that brings me to bioinspiration. There's actually a great deal that we can learn from the natural world to develop more sustainable, smarter materials and technologies. And that's because the many challenges that we face today as a society 
have an analogy, usually have an analogy in the natural world, just like passive cooling. These problems and challenges have been solved in myriad ways by millions of years of evolutionary trial and error. But to really capitalise on the wealth of biological designs out there, we actually need to move beyond superficial analogy like this to being informed by a deeper understanding of biology. We need to be bioinformed. And that's what we've been promoting through the Bioinspiration Research Initiative at the University of Melbourne. We are yet to capitalise uh, on biodiversity in bioinformed design. Together with Leslie Ng and uh, Mark Elgar, we actually did a survey of the literature on biomimetic and bioinspired materials. And we found more than 35,000 articles on this topic. But less than half of those involved collaborations with biologists. And this essentially manifests in a lack of diversity in the biological inspiration that we're drawing from. To give you an example, we found 272 papers focusing on surface adhesion inspired by biology. And almost half of those were on reptiles, but it was a single gecko species, gecko gecko, which is actually unusual in many respects. Yet there are over 1,500 gecko species with very diverse ecology and habitats and very different topad structures. So clearly we need to do more to embrace diversity in bio-inspired design. And that will mean greater interdisciplinary collaboration. So I want to end with a plea for the value of natural history collections. These collections represent decades of effort by biologists to catalogue life's diversity. They're simply invaluable. And much of the research that I've presented has relied on these collections. We are losing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And these collections are the only way we can know what we're losing or perhaps what we've lost already. <clears throat> so we need to do more to recognise and support fundamental taxonomy and our national natural history collections. So on that note, I hope I've given you a flavour of the surprising science on the light we can and cannot see from a biological perspective. And I want to thank the many people, the students and collaborators who have conducted this research. Science is absolutely a team effort. And I want to thank the funding bodies that have supported it, particularly uh, the Australian Research Council. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, I, I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that uh, that was quite an amazing talk, not only about what we can see, but probably more importantly is, is what we can't see and, and the way that uh, there's such a diversity of different wavelengths and so on out there about uh, within different species for the things that uh, attract, camouflage, protect, um, but then quite fascinating, the, I, I found it quite fascinating talking about the longer wavelengths and, and the reflection of what we don't see for heat management. And I can see some quite practical applications then about what that, that means for the way we, we build our houses, for example, and the way we, we try and keep cool in, in our particular climates as humans. And so with that, I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce tonight's second speaker, Professor Dragomir Neshev. So Dragomir is a professor in physics at the Australian National University and is the director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Transformative Meta-Optical Systems. Rather than being based in Canberra at the Shine Dome where our live audience is, tonight he's going to be joining from my uh, current hometown, Adelaide. So please welcome Dragomir. Hello, everyone. 
So th thank you, Drew, for the introduction, and thank you for all the audience uh, for being there. Apologies for not being able to present in person. As uh, Drew mentioned, I'm attending the Australian Institute of Physics Congress in Adelaide. Uh, I hope, but hope to be back by the end of the week in, back in Canberra. And I would like to thank uh, as well the Academy of Science for this invitation to, to give this talk. And what an amazing talk was uh, the presentation that David just gave us. Uh, I certainly learned quite a lot of it. So my hard role here is to uh, tell you how invisibility fits to what we have just seen. And I've um, kind of uh, trickily uh, titled my talk, Where is my invisibility cloak? And uh, we all know invisibility cloaks uh, from a uh, number of the Harry Potter's uh, movies and, and books. Uh, and you are probably asking yourself, is invisibility cloaking a science, a fiction, uh, science fiction or a reality, or perhaps uh, just a uh, uh, forgotten Romulan technology from the Star Trek movie? So while we're wondering, uh, even the physics of uh, building an invisibility cloak might be very, very complex. The actual idea behind invisibility is rather simple. Uh, and this is illustrated in, in this, uh, in this uh, graphic here, where we, if we have a light that is coming from a light source like uh, this bulb, uh, we can cloak an object like this apple here. If we can build a cloak, uh, constructed by these two spheres in the middle, uh, where in between the spheres we can bend the light in such a way that an observer on the right hand side simply sees the light waves or the light rays just as they were directly propagating from the source. So, and uh, what we need to do here is simply to make the light to bend this way, but also we need to make the light to go as fast around the curvature of the spheres such that it can reach the observer at exactly the same time as, the, as if there was nothing there. So my purpose here in this talk will be to, ask, uh, to tell you what can make such an invisibility cloak. And the question I have to you is what would Harry Potter see if he is inside this invisibility cloak? So let's see what's uh, inside. So the idea about the invisibility cloak actually came closer to reality in 2006 when uh, the, the British scientist, Sir John Pendry from Imperial College London postulated the fact that uh, one can indeed bend, bend lights in a way such that they go around the sphere as you can see here in the middle of the screen. And this can be done if we can modify the refractive index of the material between the two spheres that you are seeing here as hemispheres, such that uh, this refractive index is actually smaller than the refractive index of vacuum, smaller than one, to be able to for the light to go around it as fast as uh, if it would propagate straight through. So how can that be? The way the light is uh, usually refracted from a material is defined by the so-called Snell's law. This uh, law uh, gives the angle of the, or uh, relates the angle of the incident light, what we see pi, to the angle of the light that is bent through an interface, psi. And this is related as the ratio of the two refractive indices uh, in the air and in the medium. And this law, this Snell's law, this reflect uh, um, what we see if we, for example, step into a swimming pool and we see our legs much closer than in the reality. The truth, however, is that uh, if our spheres is made out of a material that has a larger refractive index, um, as in usual materials, the light will be bent inwards towards the center of the sphere. Well, what we want is the light actually to be bent around it. So we want to increase this angle. So we need to make the refractive index between these two spheres to be smaller than one. So the big question then was, how is that possible? Is it possible at all? And what one can do about it? So if we look at all the natural materials uh, and take all the periodic table, everything that you will see, everything that we will find 
is that all these materials have a refractive index that is larger than one, but they are optically denser, as we say in the optics uh, domain, or they have this very strong uh, complex uh, refractive index, meaning they have they strongly absorb light, so the light doesn't really propagate through these materials. So at that time, Sir John Pendry postulated that uh, one needs to find a new material with properties beyond the properties that exist in nature. And these materials were called metamaterials from the Greek word for the word meta, uh, which simply means uh, beyond. So what kind of materials are these? To get a feeling about the different sizes, we need to make uh, what is possible in the nano world, we need to uh, look at uh, different materials and their sizes, and we need to pick a material that we can mix together or structure that we can mix together. And the structures need to be much smaller than the wavelength of light, as uh, David just explained. So what do we have? So in this scale, we have uh, 10 to the minus four, which is one tenth of a millimeter, uh, up to 10 to the minus 10, which is an angstrom type sizes. And you can see the different biological species, a bacteria, uh, just a little bit smaller than a human hair. We have viruses that are the order of 100 nanometers, so uh, 10 to the minus 7, proteins, DNAs, and individual small molecules. On the more artificial size, we also have a, um, the usual devices, CMOS devices that we have in our electronics, uh, uh, like mobile phones and so on. Uh, nanowires, which are the order of a few nanometers. So this is the research field of the president of the Australian Academy of Science, Professor Jagadish. Uh, but we also see uh, carbon nanotubes uh, and graphene that are much, much small. Uh, and if we look at the wavelength of light, the wavelength of light is somewhere in the middle here. So if we pick structures that are much smaller than the wavelength of light, the light will simply go through as they were a homogeneous material. And this will be kind of the set of materials that we call metamaterials. However, in order to make an invisibility clock, one would need to be a little bit more special than just mixing these things around. So what can we do? Uh, metamaterials effectively uh, con um, consist of uh, very small inclusions, like in this case, in the middle of the screen, you see this inclusion of very tiny rings with a little split in the middle called split ring resonators that are placed so close together, much smaller than the wavelength of light, which is uh, depicted by this green wave in the middle of the screen, uh, which is of the order of 500 nanometers for green light. Uh, and we have these small inclusions that are put together, they're much smaller than the wavelength of light, and they're, brought, uh, they're put together at a space, again, much smaller than the wavelength of light. So if the light goes to such a materials, it will simply look like this uh, crystal on the left. And just to uh, show you that this is not just a, a, a science fiction, you see here on the right, uh, two images. The bottom one is an electron microscope image of a, a material that is being nanofabricated using modern nanofabrication technology. And if you see this material in a visible microscope, which is the top image here, you will see this plain homogeneous uh, a color, a blue color, which is the color that is just reflected, but you do not see the structuring of the material uh, because it's much smaller than the wavelength of light. So the blue color of this material looks pretty much exactly the same as a natural material, except that it can have properties that are rather unusual for uh, scientists. So if we think about where does this originate, where does this idea of mixing uh, making small materials by mix new materials by mixture of uh, uh, new inclusions, metallic rings or other uh, other small inclusions. If we look into the history, actually, we will see that Australia is one of the pioneering countries in this idea. So the first ideas about this was uh, proposed by uh, Professor Ross McFedrin at the time at the University of Sydney, already in 1977. As you see in this article published in Nature, and Professor McFedrin uh, showed how the electric uh, permittivity of such composite materials, as uh, the material composed of these nanorods, of uh, small metallic nanorods, what you see 
on the right hand side of the screen how the epsilon or the electric permittivity this composite material changes with the spacing between these rods uh, and their sizes. So that was a pioneering paper and this paper explained a number of important phenomena, explained uh, the way how we have, uh, um, why we see colors in this beautiful cup from the fourth century called the Lycurgus cup. This is held in the British Museum and you see that in transmission, the cup looks red, which is the picture on the right, while in the reflection, the cup looks green. This coloring comes from the fact that inside the glass of this cup, which is the, uh, de depicted in the image in the middle, we have small gold nanoparticles that reflect the green colors and then transmit the red color. This is exactly the same physics as in many of the stained glass that you've seen in the uh, number of uh, cathedrals around Europe and elsewhere, like you see here an example from the Notre Dame from 1100 AD, uh, beautiful uh, stained glass in the, uh, in the middle of the cathedral. So it explained this uh, wonderful uh, phenomena. However, uh, unfortunately, Professor McFadden could not really describe how to make the invisibility clock. And the reason for this was that the refractive index of, that the light experienced n in this case is equal to the square root of the electric permittivity times the magnetic permeability of the material. So Ross only explained how to change this epsilon. However, in a real material to make material that has a, a refractive index smaller than one, one would need to change both epsilon and mu such that the refractive index is really a real quantity. So we have no absorption. So the way Mu can be changed. Again, the idea behind this was again proposed by uh, Sir John Pendry, who proposed at the time a prototype, uh, a powerful prototype, which is a split ring resonator. So a split ring resonator, one can uh, depict as this uh, electrical circuit, which is uh, a composed of a coil and a capacitor. And when the current goes around the coil, then we have a magnetic field that is formed in the middle of this uh, uh, coil, and then we have this artificial magnetism that happens at optical frequency only. To make, however, a material that is uh, made of an optical frequency, one would need to scale all these coils to a very, very small uh, size. And one thing to point out what you see in the picture in the middle is because of this magnetism, uh, this induced magnetism or induced magnetic moment of this split ring resonator, the magnetic response of the material changes with uh, this red curve here on the screen. And at the position where the green shading is, we have this mu that is uh, smaller than one and the imaginary part of mu, which is the effectively corresponds to the absorption of the material is very, very low. So at these frequencies, at this frequency, this material can really operate with very strong uh, and can really change the magnetic permeability of the material. And to make it really operate at the optical frequencies, one could really scale this to a tiny, tiny uh, split ring resonator that can be fabricated with the modern nanofabrication technology, technologies as you see here on the right of the screen. So, now we have the two ingredients. We have the nano rod material that can control the electric permittivity, the epsilon, which Ross McFedderin described, and these split ring resonators that can control the magnetic permeability that we can put together and we can really design the refractive index of the material such that can bend the light around the inner circle and we can close this apple in the middle of the flow. And we can indeed design these uh, structure split ring resonators and nano rods to be of the right size to really bend the light in the right way. So if the invisibility is so uh, easy, why don't we have it yet? Well, there is a, a little uh, a easy answer to this. As I uh, told you before, we uh, can make this magnetic moment only a appear small enough uh, below one at a very narrow frequency range. 
So in practice, invisibility flow can be done, but if you only work for one single frequency, one single color of light, like in this red color that you see here. And if we change the color, it gets a different color, like this uh, green color, uh, this invisibility cloak will become actually rather visible to everyone who can see too. Uh, so the bottom line is, yes, we can have an invisibility cloak, but only for one single color. Well, there is also one more thing why we don't see it, and this is what we call the shadows. And why is that? Is because if any of the uh, materials that we have inside the cloak has a little bit of absorption, then if we want to cloak this balloon here on uh, that is floating around the, or flying around, uh, above the lake in Canberra, like Burley Griffith, uh, this balloon will more look like a shadow, like a green blob, rather than being completely cloaked uh, from our uh, invisibility cloak. Not to mention that the cloak will be so heavy when it's built from such a heavy material that it will simply sink into the light. Well, is it, uh, is it all bad? Well, until we find out, we have to uh, rely on camouflaging in order to make ourselves invisible like in this uh, invisibility suit here on the left, or have a special tricks about uh, uh, camouflaging at the one particular direction. But the truth is, so what is next? What is next? Where do we go from here? Is this, was this all uh, wasted effort? Uh, well, it, it turns out it's actually very, very good uh, because there was a lot of research that was invested, uh, that was put into the creating an invisibility flow. So if we think or ask ourselves what is inside the invisibility cloak, the things that are inside actually can turn out to be very useful. So I will give you three examples for this. The first example is colors. I told you that the invisibility cloak works only one color, only for one color. So effectively, everything that is made out of these nanostructures will look very colorful. And this is where we come Back to Davis' uh, examples about butterflies that are created out of uh, scales, which you see here on the uh, top left. And inside these scales, you have these very tiny nanostructures, which is the bottom left uh, picture, tiny nanostructures that change the light and bend it around such that the butterfly can uh, display this beautiful color that we see here. And I don't know if this butterfly on the right has the same nanostructures, but at least looks fantastically beautiful. So the truth is, by studying this, by, uh, as Debbie said, by studying this biomimetic structure, we can now make artificial structure that, uh, structures that uh, can really display wonderful colors. And this is an example that is uh, made by a spin-off company from our Center of Excellence, VI Colors that use a special laser writing to create these blue colors with uh, uh, yellow, um, yellow corners. And these yellow corners are based on small gratings that are being inscribed exactly like in the butterfly scale, this inscribed by a laser on the metal surface of this uh, key ring. And if you look under the um, uh, microscope, under the electron microscope, uh, these gratings look like tiny nanostructures that are put together on a small, uh, in small lines and create, can create a beautiful color. And just for those who love cars, you can actually buy a Maserati that is, um, that has a color based on such color. Maybe a little bit expensive, but you can buy. So number two example, bending the light was actually useful, learning how to bend the light because we can now bend the light using ultra thin surfaces. And this has uh, uh, led to creating lenses that can bend and focus the light, lenses that are 1000 times thinner than a human hair, and lenses that can one day replace what we have in our phones, that the lenses are already the thickest part of our mobile phone. These lenses operate exactly the same principles. They are composed of small nanostructures with different sizes that can bend the light. In this case, they are made out of silicon, so the same technology. 
that is uh, used for chip making. And one can create uh, lenses by simply changing the or mapping the face of a lens, which is a parabolic face, to uh, rocks a different color. And number three example, something a bit more exotic, we can actually do image processing by borrowing ideas from these tiny nanostructures that were created from the ideas of the invisibility flow. And you can see here an example, an image of Parliament House in Canberra. If you pass this image through a tiny structures to a meta surface, a surface with tiny structures on uh, on its uh, surface, which is what you see here on the right, it's a scanning electron microscope image of the fabricated surface. This surface will block the rays that propagate exactly along the center and will only display the, uh, the edges of the parliament house, which is a processing called edge detection. It is a very important uh, process, which is used for uh, autonomous vehicle for na their navigation. And this is done without any energy, without any computing directly by a single surface directly in the, uh, by modifying the light as it passes through from the image to the our sensor to the camera. And it's actually pretty good. Uh, so if I can ask the question again, where is my invisibility cloak? All the elements where, which were developed in order to display invisibility, uh, now they have entered a number of devices what we see I mentioned flat lenses, but also polarization imaging, uh, special microscope cover slips and wearable biosensors. And they can also go to a number of application, applications like three-dimensional imaging is something that you already have in iPhone 14, uh, use exactly in the same principle, augmented reality glassing, glasses uh, we are coming very soon. We are hoping holographic displays will also follow soon. Uh, LiDAR technology, image classification, and last but not least, uh, light cell. So to come back, my invisibility cloak is part of these butterflies uh, and part of all the colors, many of the colors that you see in nature. And with this, I want to stop and thank you for your for listening. Thank you so much, Dragomir. That was fantastic. And uh, it's amazing to see the complexity of the different science that you have to put into it and then that animals make it work so easily. Evolution truly is amazing. Um, so I'd like to now invite questions from the audience, both here in person in Canberra and online. And Drew's gonna be managing online here. And Drew put out a bit of a challenge that um, those of us here in Canberra, we need to up our game a little bit on the questions. Um, so if you have questions here, please do come down to the front and also put your questions online. First takers. Well, if there's, if, if there's no one uh, in the shine dome at, at the microphone, so I'll give everybody the opportunity to, to step up. Oh, is that someone walking across the yep. front? Yep, we're getting one coming. All right, up. all right. Um, hello, Dragomir, it is Patrick. Hey, Patrick. How, how are you doing, Drew? Thank you very much for convening all of this, and thank you to be, it's so fantastic. Um, my question is, Dragomir, did you get all those ideas and those ideas from the history of all this? Did any of those come from biology? Or were they all started and then you just discovered this, this, um, I, I don't know, what, what, what's the word, synergy or whatever you want to use for this, this thing, the similarities between them? Which uh, came first, the, the butterfly uh, or the egg? <laughs> David had uh, the answer already in her, in her presentation that actually both communities developed uh, together and developed many ideas together. At some point, some of the, of the people did uh, work together also with biologists. Some of the nanoscientists worked with biologists and vice versa uh, to come to the synergy that, that we see, uh, that we saw in my presentation and also in David's presentation 
Uh, but I wouldn't say one or the other was first or, or, or second. David, would you have any comment from your side? This? Yeah, well, I think um, physicists will often develop the ideas from first principles. And the thing about um, biological structures is usually they're incredibly complex. So often to really understand the complexity of biological structures, we have to draw on the knowledge and devices um, and particularly the technologies that um, are often developed first by physical scientists. So, How close are you to making, with the VI, the, the company that has made the keychain, can you make a model of one of the butterflies? The, uh, it's so, just a little challenge, sorry. <laughs> so, so at least our uh, company, uh, uh, spin-off companies, my, uh, two of my colleagues at Demos, uh, they can make uh, pretty much any colors. Uh, it is uh, so far just on metal surfaces. Uh, it uses a so-called osmonic color. So this was uh, similar to the Lacrucus cap I, I showed you, not so much similar to the butterflies. Butterflies do use more uh, a transparent material that is a, a type of a polymer uh, or similar to a polymer. Uh, so where our guys are heading, they have a, actually a very aspirational idea. Uh, they're working together with uh, 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 artists in the United States. The idea is to make a colorful sphere that we can put up on the moon. And because these colors are super uh, resistive to various uh, changes in the environment, including radiation and, and other harsh environments that, that we have in the moon, so we think the sphere is, uh, can be put on the moon and will be nice and colorful there. A little bit of a science fiction, but we, it's very aspirational to us. Super. Thanks for that question, leading us off. Drew, do we see any online? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might, I might, I might jump in with one of our online questions. Now, I think... Uh, keeping with uh, a bit of our science fiction theme here. Um, so we've heard some great examples in, in both the talks about how well nature and, and biology can build these kinds of complex structures. And I guess a, a, a question to Dragomir is, what if nature's figured out how to do the invisibility cloak? How will we know that these, uh, these animals exist? Is it... Is it, an, and I guess maybe you, you hinted to it about looking in the shadows. Yeah, thank you for that uh, wonderful question. So indeed, the uh, two parts that I mentioned, one is the shadowing effect and the other is the strong dispersion. They are physical limitations. They are uh, something that come in, as physicists, we call this causality, is something that uh, can you cannot break the laws of physics. So any practically any invisibility cloak, at least the one that is based on the science that I described today, they will have this dispersion and they will have dispersion for different colors and they will have a shadow at a, at a different color that, that we see. So we will definitely know unless there is another Romulus technology that we still don't know about that. I think that makes us a little more comfortable then. <laughs> Other questions here in Canberra? Drew, do you have more online? Yeah, yeah. So an, a, a, another question, and, and this is for, for both Devi and, and Dragomir, but um, in your examples, Dragomir, about these these nanostructures about how they could be used for a range of different applications. And I guess a, a, a question probably more to, to Debbie is, do we see examples in biology beyond just controlling heat and color? Do we, are there examples of animals that might use these, the control of color for, for other applications? I'll go first. I, uh, absolutely. So uh, in, in biology, of course, vision and, and colour and heat management are not the only things that animals need to do to survive. 
and there are um, myriad examples of um, nanostructures in biology that have inspired applications. So, for example, there are nanostructures on moth eyes that trap, uh, uh, trap light and essentially are anti-reflective, and that's been, <coughs> sorry, developed into anti-reflective coatings. Uh, that's a classic example. A lot of biological surfaces are self-cleaning, so they, um, they essentially allow our dust and particles to, to clean off the, you know, um, flow off the surfaces. That's been, uh, and they're nano, due to nanostructures, that's been developed and applied in all sorts of technologies or water repelling surfaces. Most of you have probably heard of the lotus leaf examples, the droplets of water. Um, I guess the, the, the water forms droplets that enable them to just flow off. That's due to nanostructuring of the leaf surfaces. And most recently, and I think really excitingly, they're looking to the nanostructures on the surface of uh, insect wings uh, as inspiration for ways to fight bacterial infections. And that's because these tiny little nanostructures actually act like knives, they call them nano knives, and they mechanically uh, rupture bacteria. We're really reliant on antibiotics and chemical ways of fighting bacteria and increasingly bacteria resistant to our antibiotics. So that's now um, got some really nice um, applications uh, in, in medicine and, and tissue grafting actually creating structures for tissue grafts that help fight the bacterial in infections with these nanostructured surfaces. That, uh, that term, nano knives, is very evocative. I can picturing a whole series of little itty bitty knives hacking about bacteria. <laughs> Other questions, Drew, from online or? Yes, uh, so, so a question here for Dragomir. Um, so just to, in, in terms of the invisibility cloak, if, if we, we could uh, manufacture it, can you give us a feel for how much it might weigh? And, and probably the most important question is, is a feel for how much it might cost. <laughs> Some of the real practical questions as we search for Christmas presents at the, at the last minute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I was muted. Uh, that's indeed a, a very <laughs> important question, and we have been asked by a number of people and number of organizations. When, when can we buy it, and uh, and how much is going to cost? How much is going to wait? And uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer to, to this question, unfortunately. Uh, uh, what uh, I'm more interested in is how we can apply this physics behind the behind the invisibility cloud, the physics that was developed now in the last 10, 20 years, how we can develop to, to some new uh, electronic devices, new optical devices that can do well beyond what we can do uh, in conventional optics. And, and David mentioned uh, some of the ideas what uh, nature can do well beyond that we can, uh, we can see, for example, one uh, example I want to mention is uh, uh, some insects and butterflies can see polarization of light, which is something that for us is very difficult to understand. But uh, in a simple term, this is the way that the light field oscillates in particular direction or in circular direction. Uh, and some insects can uh, see that. Uh, for us, it's incredible. But if you, if you ask Patrick and go to Questacon, you will see this nice polarization experiment with the different colors that are forming once you have two polarizers uh, and a piece of uh, scotch tape or plastic in between. So the world of uh, nature can be actually even more colorful than we can imagine. Um, and this is what is for me is super exciting. Even I believe this is even more exciting than having an invisibility clock that can work for one wavelength only. 
I'm going to take the, the prerogative of asking a question myself, if that's all right. Debbie, I've got a question. Uh, you, you mentioned the value of the archives and particularly pointed out the National Insect Collection. And uh, having gone to natural history museums over many years, some butterflies preserve their colors beautifully and some not as well. Can you learn anything about the sort of the structures through the, the decay over time of how well they work with their colors over time? Yeah, well, usually the decay is decay of pigments. So most uh, colors out there in nature, there's a combination of um, pigments and structures. The structures preserve almost indefinitely. So you have really vividly colored beetles preserved in fossils, for example. Uh, but the pigments uh, decay over time. So even those vivid butterfly wings, they'll have a layer of melanin uh, which helps absorb any remaining light. So although we, we like to think of colours as purely structural or purely pigments, actually it's almost always a combination. Uh, and what's really inspired, uh, I guess, a lot of the applications in coloured materials have been uh, the the structures in some of those wings rather than the pigments. Yeah. But even the pigments themselves can be arranged in complex ways to actually increase how much um, light reflection there is. They form structures themselves. Okay. So, yep, it's... <laughs> the deeper you delve, the more, the more complex it is, I guess. The more questions you ask. Mm. Okay, I'm afraid that's um, all the questions that we have time for tonight. Um, I want to thank enormously both Dragomir and Devi for their talks and to Drew, my co-host for tonight. And um, I'd like to also thank Jira at Jira Station Wines and Edge Catering, which I think we all enjoyed. Uh, a little bit of blue cheese and refreshments earlier in the evening was delightful. But I most particularly really want to thank you, the audience out there and here in person, for coming tonight and those of you who come throughout the series. The Academy is really looking forward to seeing you back here next year in 2023. Series details are being finalized at the moment, so stay tuned for more information. Um, the Academy really appreciates your loyalty and your commitment, and it's wonderful to see people coming back every year to the spe uh, public speaker series. So we do hope you'll come back and join us in 2023 and bring your friends and more people to, uh, to come along. And uh, the dates are now available. We'll share any more information as soon as possible. And I'd like to wish everyone a happy and safe festive season. And I hope you can enjoy the exhibits around here that look very Christmassy. Um, so thank you very much and good night.